Good morning, Crosstown. I'm Pastor John. Thanks for joining us this morning again from the comforts of your living room. We're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, today I have with me Pastor Eber on my right and Pastor Tim on my left. And we are going to be doing what's called 3 and 30. You're going to get to hear from three of your pastors over the next couple weeks on three subjects. So if you put John, Eber, and Tim together and then 3 and 30... It's like we're the Jets, but not the ones from New Jersey, all right? Yeah, that was for you, Corey. Enough bad jokes. Now, I know if you're anything like me, you cannot wait for us to get together and be able to see each other face-to-face, -face, not through the TV screen, no more Zoom meetings and all of this stuff. Now, I want you to know that since the pandemic has started, we've all wondered the same thing, pastors and everybody alike. When are we going to be able to reopen the church and have services? And a lot of you have actually asked us that question. Now, I know this because some of you, some of you may miss the music, seeing the worship live and singing along. But let's be real. The main reason is you guys miss seeing your campus pastors every week. And I can't blame you because I miss you guys too. So on that note, I was actually having a conversation with some really good friends of Nicole and mine uh, as New York was starting to open up phase one of the reopening plan. And we were having a good discussion and we were talking about really kind of how much of a bummer it is that we're not even into summer yet and all of the things that have been canceled already, uh, whether it's summer camps, whether it's the fairs, uh, even Kingdom Bound at Darien Lake is already canceled. Uh, so then we came around to this idea of when are we going to open up churches so that we can all gather together in person? Uh, and they were asking not just from a, the, because they wanted to see each other. See, because the face-to-face the -face interaction not only was a morale boost, but it was also kind of a little bit of accountability for them. And they also, not just for them, but their kids as well. So they were desiring to not just uh, go to see people, but to serve people uh, so that their kids could see other kids and also to keep their kids serving. So we were having a conversation about this and about the, the limitations we have about gathering. Um, and what God did through that conversation is really pretty neat. And we'll talk about that a little later. Um, I'm going to tell you kind of the conversation that we had, except for I'm hoping it's going to be a little bit more interesting and memorable. So in light of everything going on in our world, I would hate and we should not let the idea of our limitations to gather in person slow us down, prevent us, or stop us mentally, physically, or spiritually. So I think in lieu of things that we need to keep our foot on the gas, and that's G-A-S-S, -S, on the gas. And what I mean by that is the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. So what does it mean to put our foot on the gas and run the race? Well, first thing we need to do is we should be gathering together. That's your first one. That's the G, gathering together. Church, we've been doing this since this whole thing started. Now, just like Pastor Tim had talked about a couple weeks ago, it might not be ideal or perfect, but we've been gathering. And now we're entering into another phase where we can gather in small groups. So what we want to encourage you guys to do is if you're somebody who's, who's really hungry for face-to-face -face interaction, we want to encourage you to be thinking about uh, maybe coming to prayer meetings. Uh, all of our campuses have those. Um, you know, maybe meeting up with your small groups again. Again, if you're comfortable, but also trying to practice some safe habits like distancing and masking if you need to. And one of the other things that Pastor Jeremy uh, had talked about in his message earlier in the week, which I really agree with and love, is the idea of having a watch party. Now, if you're wondering what a watch party is, it's simply this. It's like uh, getting together for the Super Bowl, except for it's for church service. You invite some of your friends over, watch the service, have a discussion about it, Maybe stay and, and eat lunch together, but really have that fellowship. Now, if you're not comfortable with gathering uh, in person, we're still going to continue, like Pastor Jeremy said, to have those online services. Uh, 
So we need to gather. The second thing we need is we need to have accountability with each other. Uh, accountability is very important. Uh, we see it here in Scripture. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray with one another. So we need to be doing that. We need to be uh, having conversations with people, confessing the sins that we're struggling with. Um, we need to be praying for each other. And what that looks like simply is just having an ongoing, it could be a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week conversation with somebody that we can do that, that we can confess our sins, either that we're struggling with or something that we know is coming up in our schedule that we're really going to be struggling with, sharing that with each other and also having the opportunity to pray with each other. So we need to have gather, we need to be accountable, and we need to serve each other and serve those around us, okay? Um, 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, which is a spiritual gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. So we need to be serving each other in the church. We can still be doing that. And then Matthew 5.16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we need to be serving each other in the church. We also need to be active in serving also our communities. Now, how do we do that? If you're, if you're one of those high-risk people uh, and you're uncertain about going out, how can you serve? It's simple. Um, if you have a telephone, if you have a computer or if you have a stamp, you can serve through your gift of encouragement. Uh, you can write encouraging letters. You can write uh, prayers over someone and send that to them. Uh, you can make phone calls to check on people, uh, to encourage them. Um, and you can also FaceTime each other and do video chats, continue to do that. But that is a way, if you are a little nervous about going out, that you can still be serving people. Now, if, if you're fine with it, if you're more comfortable getting out and about, you're not a high-risk person, uh, then what you can do to serve people in the church and even in your community is maybe find somebody who is high-risk, who is uncomfortable with going out, stop by their house, do some yard work for them, work on projects outside for them, and you know what? If they need to make a trip out of town to pick up some groceries or pick up something, Offer to take that list, go out of town, and pick that stuff up for them. We need to be doing something. So we need to be gathering with each other. We need to have accountability with each other. We need to serve each other, and we need to be serving others around us. Church, one of our core values that hangs on all the banners uh, in our sanctuaries, and you can see it, uh, ours in Wellsville is right up here in the front, and it's, a, it's one of my favorite ones. It says, Think inside the box, and it's got a picture, but the bottom of it says this. We will embrace our limitations, and they will inspire us to our greatest creativity. So back to the conversation I had uh, with my friends is, uh, in lieu of having this conversation, uh, they decided to have what we're calling a watch party, but they decided to have a couple families over to watch the sermon together, have a discussion afterwards, and then have a cookout. And they were so encouraged by that fellowship and that, that ability to, to serve these other families that they're going to keep doing that. So I thought that was really neat how, how God uh, worked through our limitations to gather to really inspire something uh, to really benefit each other. So church, what I want to encourage us is to do that. Let's embrace the limitations that we have. We might not be able to gather for church this week or next week or maybe for the next couple weeks. But instead of fretting about that, let's grasp those. Let's keep our foot on the gas and let's run the race so that God can have all the glory. Thanks, Pastor John. Um, I know that we've all had been granted all this abundant family time over the last 10 or so weeks. And I don't want to ask how it went. I want to, you know, because I know that there's been, you know, most assuredly some really good memories that have made, been made, ones that you wish that you could repeat. And most likely there's definitely been some frustrating ones, ones that, man, I just wish we could redo or forget altogether. And, and that's makes sense since we've been kind of strongly encouraged with all of this extra isolation time. 
But I want to take the next few minutes and just kind of talk to you guys about uh, some principles that I think that, and I, I believe that if you were to put these into practice, that you would see the communication skills between you and those in your household really improve, become something that is healthy and encouraging. Uh, now, these things are from Ephesians chapter 4. They, there are six principles, and I know that seems like a lot, and I would encourage you just to take one or two of these things and work at them at a time, but understand that because they're right there in Ephesians 4, that that's just that's contained really well. Now, I'm not going to be able to read all the verses that go along with each principle, but yet you will find them in the sermon notes, and I would encourage you guys to look at them at a later date and consider what the Scripture says. All right? So first, the first principle is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and through 3. And it kind of gives the indication, the principle says, make your home a place of peace. Now, conflict is a normal place in the home, right? And we probably have experienced that over the last several weeks. But what kind of sets your family apart will be the fact of how you guys can kind of, how your interactions are when circumstances collide, right? When all of a sudden things get tense or high and there's, you know, some emotion that's there, how you guys respond to each other does uh, make and set you apart from others. And see, if we look at verses 1 through 3 here in chapter 4, it says, and it gives five different characteristics that you can put into practice. If you adopt these things, it will promote the spirit of unity and peace within your home. And those things are, those five characteristics are humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, and love. And I'm telling you, if you were to take those things and let them become things that are characterizing your home, they will impact that environment and make it something that is encouraging and peaceful. Number two, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 and verse 25. Now, this principle is one that we have heard before and most likely have even said before because we want to give some justification for, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. But this principle is to speak truth in love. See, to speak truth means to be honest, even when it means taking a risk. See, it's very important that we're honest with each other. Yet in that aspect, there's that risk because we don't know how it's going to be taken by the other party. But the other factor of this principle is to speak truth in love. Be honest, but to speak it in love and to communicate it in terms, in kind and gentle terms. So we can be honest while being kind and gentle. And that's how I would encourage you guys to do. See, it's not really what about, it's not so often about what we have to say, it's how we say it to each other that really makes the difference. So I would consider you, I would have you guys consider how you guys confront each other. And remember that you can be the start of the change that you desire in your home. Just to speak truth in love. Number three, Ephesians 4, 17, and also verses 21 through 24, where it says communicate. And it gives that principle, communicate intentionally. And I want you to take a few moments and just think about the communication patterns of your parents as you were growing up. Because they were the first example of what good and bad communication was. And then I want you to consider the positive and negatives that were there and how that they are influencing and impacting the communication patterns in your home right now. Because they are. If we don't take the time to think about those things, they automatically just become part of who we are. And one thing you have to understand is that patterns can be changed. They're, they are not unchangeable. And according to these verses here, our pattern needs to be that that resembles God's righteousness and holiness. Meaning that we need to speak again the truth and don't lie. We need to be that honest with each other, with how we're feeling, how we think, what we're going to decide to do. So if there needs to be adjustments within the home, just to be honest, then I would encourage you guys to make those certain adjustments. Number four, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. The principle is to build each other up with wholesome words. See, and we all know this, but once we say words, we can never pull them back. 
That's a scary thought. That idea to say, man, if I just react and I just let things fall out of my mouth, man, I can't pull them back. I have to now deal with whatever I just said and work through it. We need to be very careful with the things that come out of our mouth. See, in James chapter 1, verse 19, it talks about the fact that it says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. James is saying, man, be certain that you hear. Pay attention. Listen. Take the time to hear what is being said to you or read the situation that you're in before you open your mouth and say something you can't get back. See, times of correction and frustration are when, one of the biggest times where we just react in what we say. And then we, it just adds to the fire, adds to the, you know, to the situation in a negative way. And we want to make sure that we try to control that aspect of what we do. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do in my own home, still working on it, not perfect at this, is to say three positive encouragements for every one word of criticism so that I can start building the excitement or building that level of just building each other up because the world is all about tearing each other down. Number five, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Be angry, yet do not sin. Now, this one is easier said than done, isn't it? This is the aspect of that. We all feel angry at times. And we have to understand that anger is an emotion, a real emotion that God has allowed and enabled us to feel. But yet, the emotion is not the problem. The problem is, is when we allow the emo that emotion to take power over our responses and our reactions to each other, right? That it totally influences and impacts what we say and do because the emotion is in control. No longer are we in control. And if we look back again at the end of First, uh, James chapter 1, verse 19, it says, and be slow to get angry. That aspect, again, that whole verse, listen, take time to hear before you say something you can't get back and respond in a way that makes it worse. See, God understands that we are going to get angry. He understands that. He says, I want you to get angry at the situation or the problem. Don't take it out on the person. Again, consider how you express your anger based on principle number four, where it talks about building each other up in a way in which encourages one another. Number six, the final principle here in Ephesians 4, comes from verses 31 through 32, where it says, choose kindness and forgiveness. See, your home, your most intimate place, needs to be a place where everyone can be and become who God desires them to be. Yet, it only happens if we follow the instructions within this book. When we are tempted to respond harshly with each other, we need to remember God's model of forgiveness and choose instead to be and to, to show kindness and forgiveness to one another. Because we understand we're not perfect. But yet, God can help all of us, to develop and establish and create an environment within our home that gives that sense of peace and unity. Now, kids, parents, I'm not saying that there isn't a time and a place for correction and discipline. The Bible is very clear that these are to, this is to be a, a huge part and an important part of raising kids that are in our home. We need to raise our kids to know and honor who God is with their life. Yet, yeah. remember, parents, that, when, that we are the first example of what they see as good and bad examples, or good and bad communications patterns. And we can do this if we follow the principles in God's word. Good morning, Crosstown. Uh, Pastor Eber, Pastor John, thank you uh, guys for those wise words. Appreciate that. Uh, it's, it's my understanding, church, that uh, because Pastor Jeremy isn't here this morning, he isn't preaching with us this morning, that we can preach on whatever we want. So here we go. 
Uh, I'm actually preaching, the, the title of my, uh, my message this morning is called Be Rich. And uh, so many of us have heard of this, this message called the prosperity gospel. And it's a message that said, God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to be rich. And it's, it's pretty popular because who doesn't want loads of cash? Who doesn't uh, want 57 sports cars? And who doesn't want luxury homes and fishing boats? But church, the prosperity gospel is a lie. But there is some truth to God wanting you to be rich. So uh, listen to what 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19 has to say. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Did you hear that? We're to be rich in good works. And the problem is that we like to put a period after the word rich so that it seems like God is commanding us to be rich. He's commanding us to be wealthy. That's not the case. And we can see in verse 17 that it warns against putting our, ho- our hopes in riches. We are to be rich in good works and, and generous and ready to, to share. Guys, when we do these things, it's a safeguard against becoming materialistic and a, a safeguard against um, putting our hopes in the uncertainty of the, of the, the riches of this world. Um, so uh, I, I have a question for you. Who blew their tax return or their stimulus check already? Raise your hands. Uh, I'm just kidding because I can't see you. Um, but when you get that deposit, man, when that money hits your account, uh, it's gone, right? Because you've got a running list of things that you need to spend it on, projects and other things. So, man, you have a running list that you got to spend it on, and, and now you've got the funds to back it. So when it, when it hits, it's gone. So what if we approached our generosity like this? Um, only we have an endless supply to back our, our being generous. So when we consider the richness of, of God's love and, and God's grace, his mercy, and we consider uh, that these are credited to our account, and the, it's evidenced by God's goodness. It's evidenced by all that God has already done for us. And then we consider on top of that the inheritance that we receive in what's to come. Guys, we should be the most motivated givers in the history of forever. Church, we give because of what we've been given. Spend your time, spend your talents, spend your treasure like you had an endless supply. Now, being rich is this mentality that um, we, we get and we store. We get and we store, and we, we store up more money and, and more materials so that we have more than everybody else. And many of us want God to make us wealthy so that we can spend our riches on our own comforts and our own luxuries. And, and that's why so many people fall for this message, because it's appealing. We like the sounds of that. And so many people fall for that. But Christians, listen, that is not why we're here. That is not what we do. Scripture says to be rich in doing the exact opposite. Um, instead of being rich by the world's standards of, of gathering and storing, the Christians are to be rich in giving. God wants us to be rich um, in generosity from, from his riches, from his endless supply of riches. And we do that by, by being generous and, and ready to do good works and ready to share. And then we see the result of this in verse 19. It says, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So church, we're not gathering and storing up. We're giving and storing up. Let that sink in for just a minute. We're storing up in a life that is to come. And for the Christians, the Bible says the life that is to come is truly life. And we look at this life and we like some aspects of it and we can find joy and happiness here. But man, sometimes I think we're, we misunderstand that this isn't truly life. Truly life is, is still on its way. Still, uh, truly life is, is still to come. And listen, you cannot store up both here 
and there. I'm going to say it again. You cannot store both here and there. Now, I have uh, a quote from Enduring Word Bible Commentary. I really like it. I use it a lot, and, and I like what it has to say about this particular passage. It says this, Many think the main reason for giving unto the Lord is because the church needs money. This just isn't true. The most important reason to give is because you need to be a giver. It is God's way of guarding you against greed and trust in uncertain riches. God will provide for his work, even if you do not give. So this begs the question, what if we don't give? Let me ask you another question to kind of answer this one. Have you been on the receiving end of, of God's richness? Have you experienced the richness of God? In light of what we've received, in light of what we've been given, guys, we should be motivated and, and ready to, um, to give. Not giving for the Christian is not an option. Giving, uh, think about it. It's, it's what God has done for us. It's what he still does. It's what Jesus has done, and it's what we are supposed to do. Church, we give because of what we have been given. Now, Paul tells Timothy in verse 17, he says, Command, charge them. Charge them, the Christians, to be given. To, to be good, uh, do good and, and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Command them and charge them. And then again in 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, Paul is talking about generosity again, and this is what he says. Now this I say, he who, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Think about that. When, when I think about these, these two verses, um, so in, in Timothy and then now in Corinthians, there are three things that come to my mind when I'm thinking about generosity in the Christian. We're commanded, we're commended, and we're compensated. We're commanded, again, in verse 17, when Paul tells Timothy to command them, charge them. And then we're commanded in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says God loves a cheerful giver. And then we're compensated, again, from 1 Timothy 6, 19. It says, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. We're, com we're commanded, we're commanded, we're compensated. Now, guys, we serve, we love, we give, because of what we've been given. And listen, Crosstown, this is part of our DNA. Pastor John talked about it earlier. But this is part of our DNA. You can walk into our churches at any location, and you can look at our DNA on the walls. And one of the DNA says we are generous um, with God's resources. We are generous with God's resources. It's part of who we are. It's part of what we do. Think about it like this. God is giving us his Visa Infinity card for generosity. We just have to use it. Now, I also want you to think about, uh, uh, let me say this. I was thinking about, you know, as I was doing this message, and, and earlier on you heard me say that uh, spend your time, spend your talent, spend your treasure um, like you had an endless supply. And, and what comes to mind for me is I just kind of sat and thought through this. Well, what comes to mind when we, when we spend our time? Um, what comes to mind for me is, is all the people who make a Sunday morning service possible. Um, I look at all the volunteers who are in kid zone, the people who are, are ushering and greeting and, the, and those who are in hospitality. And you're giving your time so that people can come and experience a service on a Sunday morning and be encouraged through worship, be encouraged through a message. And that's awesome. We might not have service right now, but you can still be generous with your time. Maybe, like, like Pastor John said, maybe you have a neighbor that needs some things. You can run to the grocery store. Or maybe you can mow their lawn. We can be generous with our time still. And then what I'm thinking about, be generous with our talents. Now, I'm a worship guy, and so I experience the worship and, and behind the scenes of that. So what comes to mind for me, for people who are generous with their talents, is obviously the worship teams and the tech people. I mean, many of them, they come in the middle of the week and, and go through a practice. It's two or three hours long, and sometimes four or five if it's a, a week where we're doing a together day. But, and then they come early on Sunday morning, and they stay for both services. And then... 
Then there are the together days that, are, that can be crazy. Those people are sharing a talent that benefits the church as a whole. They're giving of themselves, and man, we appreciate that. And then, you know, we, we, again, we're not meeting right now. So how can we share our talents? Well, there are still ways. Maybe you have the gift of, of serving, a, a gift of hospitality, a gift of encouragement. You can still be using that right now, and you should be. This is a great time to be. So we encourage you to, to continue to give in those ways. And then this one, this one gets me, giving of our, our treasure. Church, we're, we're on the verge eventually of launching a fifth campus, eventually. Um, guys, that doesn't, that doesn't happen without people give, being giving, uh, people giving and giving of their, their treasure. We don't just launch five campuses and it just happens like that. It happens because people are generous. People give of, of themselves in, in their time, in their, in their talents, but also in their treasure. And, and we're able to see the, the impact of the gospel, the light of the gospel continue on in these communities because people give. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say, I don't think God's done at Crosstown. I don't think he's done. I'm not announcing a new campus or anything, um, but I don't think God's done. And we want you to keep plugging along with us. Keep, keep giving. And again, this isn't, this isn't just church asking for your money. That's not what this is. We're commanded to give of our time, our talents, and our treasure. And why? Well, we give because of what we've been given. Hope you can take that with you and remember that. I just want to say before we close here that uh, Pastor Eber, Pastor John, uh, it's a privilege to be able to preach with you guys today. Kind of a neat idea. Really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, church, we hope that it's been encouraging to you. Uh, hope it encourages you to, to dig into God's word, to keep going. Um, for parents to be mindful of, of your leadership in the home and to keep your foot on the gas, even in this time of uncertainty and awkwardness and all the craziness going on. And then to remember to give. It's not always about money. But uh, what a privilege it is to be together today. Hope you take something with you this morning. Uh, I'd love to be able to close this in prayer. So would you guys pray with me? Oh, Father, you are so good. I know I say that a lot in my prayers, God, and I don't mean to be a resounding gong. God, I pray it because I mean it. I pray it because I've seen it. It's evident in my life. I can see it. Is evidence in others' lives, Lord, and and we're just thankful for your overwhelming goodness to us, and we pray that you would continue to pour out your your grace and your mercy and your love on us, Lord, and and I pray that you'd help us to be motivated uh, to continue to chase after you, and God, in these three things that we've heard this morning, to keep our foot on the gas, um, to be wise, and to think about how we are leaders in our homes as parents and even grandparents, and even I would I would say older siblings, and um, Father, give us wisdom in that. Um, it's so easy to get discouraged and let our emotions get the best of us. And then in this area of giving, this isn't an easy thing uh, to preach about. Um, but God, you, you challenge us. You, you command us to be giving. And, and Father, I pray that you would let that sink, in, sink into our hearts. Uh, let it sink into the core of our being and really search ourselves out and see what you're calling us to be giving. Um, Father, we love you. We pray just for... Um, wisdom coming up with decisions having to be made and, and the things that are happening around us. God, help us to uh, live out the light of the gospel. We can preach all we want, Father, but I pray that people see a sermon in our lives before we ever say a word. Let us be those kind of Christians, God. Father, you are so good. We love you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.